This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The matchup is set for the 2023 College Football National Championship game between the Michigan Wolverines and the Washington Huskies. We are here today to break down that matchup with Dr. Ed Fang, get his read on both sides of this game, key takeaways from the semifinal matchups, and some player props he likes over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as I am every Wednesday by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com. Check him out on Twitter at thepowerrank as well. And Ed, the Michigan Wolverines are in the national championship game taking on Washington. It's actually two sides of uh, of a good Ed matchup here because you've been on Michael Penix Jr. for a very long time and he gets to face Michigan here. So it's kind of a win-win for you. That's right. We get a Big Ten championship game in the <laughs> national championship. So that's kind of nice. And yeah, I guess it's kind of win-win. I mean, I think let's not forget that I went through a pretty big stretch of fading Washington. It's true. Uh, sidewise this season. And they they certainly had their struggles. I do think some of them uh, show up in this game, which we'll get to. But um, yeah, no, it should be it should be a good matchup. You were very profitable in your read of Washington this year, though, because you were fading them when they had their issues in the middle part of the year, and then you were on them last week when they decided to win that game outright. So I feel like your read of Washington overall has been pretty good this year, which to me at least. I think gives more credence to what the numbers may say, not to spoil things about what this about this specific matchup. Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, I think I think someone else. This is pretty good. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the props I gave out did not win, but but we'll talk about that again uh, towards the end of the show. Get a touchdown at least, so it's okay. Uh, it was at least fun to watch. Regardless, we'll talk about that later on. We're going to talk about uh, takeaways from the semifinals. We'll talk about the side and total for this game and also player props and likes for this weekend. Just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Big week on tap for this week because we, of course, have NFL Week 18 coming up. We'll break down that with Ed tomorrow right here on this exact same feed. And we'll also talk some player props for week 18 with tom vecchio coming up on friday in addition to that tom will have a couple episodes of primetime tom breaking down both the saturday night and sunday night football games texans colts and then bills dolphins all right here in the covering the spread podcast feed so make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts if you like what you hear leave us a five-star rating on apple Podcasts or spotify you can also find all these shows over on fanduel tv plus the nfl regular season is wrapping up but there is still time to get in on the action with fanduel america's number one sportsbook right now new customers get 150 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five or guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays, bets via the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan. Kentucky, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 789 7777, or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1 800 9 with in Indiana, 1 800 522 4700, or visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y in New York. 
Let's dig in now to this national championship game between Michigan and Washington right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Michigan is a four and a half point favorite total in this game is 55 and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook. Now, we talked a lot about your your model, which is very reactive to new data. We got a lot of very good data for this matchup on Monday. So what were your biggest takeaways from each team in the semifinals that apply to this matchup next week on Monday? My prediction actually didn't change at all after the semifinal games. I had Michigan by three, about three points. uh, And my prediction is Michigan by 3.3 points. So uh, both Michigan and Washington got bumped up by about a point after their performances in the semifinal games. I don't really see any value in the side here. So, you know, I mean, I think it it kind of becomes a little bit more granular in terms of, you know, what you want to take and and how you want to analyze this game. but uh, but yeah, I, I I think you know kind of the analysis of this game is really in the matchups uh, and not in like the overall team analysis. So let's talk about those matchups then, because we were talking prior to the Ohio State game. You're like, eh, it's Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, a lot of some other talent at uh, at receiver for Ohio State, and we get a. Similar version here uh, with the Washington wide receivers facing Michigan's cornerbacks. It's a tough task here, given what they can do. How do you view that matchup here? The Washington pass catchers against Michigan secondary in this matchup. I certainly think it's a scary matchup for Michigan and their secondary. I think Washington is uh, really good on offense. I talked about like a really high ceiling um, for this offense. Uh, that's actually why I had my members uh, bet Washington minus two and a half for, for plus money in, in the semifinal game. I, I thought they could lose and may potentially lose badly, but if they were going to play really well, they had a chance to win that game. And then two and a half to seem like the right number because, because of field goals and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, no, they certainly have a high ceiling. Um, how, uh, how, how does Michigan match up? I think they'll do a little bit better than Texas. I think Will Johnson is is kind of known as an elite cornerback, and I can't really figure out why he's not on big boards right now. It's not like he was hurt that much this season. He's played reasonably well. Um, he you know had a big play against Marvin Harrison Jr. against Ohio State. Otherwise, wasn't. Um, I didn't think he was great against them. Besides that one play where he got the pick, and. Um, I actually think Washington's receiving core as a unit is better than Ohio State's. Uh, I don't think anyone can match up with Marvin Harrison Jr., but Roma Dunze is not that far behind. Um, You could see his speed and his talent on the field in that semifinal game. And again, I think Jalen McMillan is almost as good. Um, When you look at kind of significant games, you know, Dunze had 9.4 targets per game, about 111 yards per game in 14 games this year. McMillan in the five games that he was really there and back, uh, 8.4 targets, 105 yards per game. They had an equal number of targets in, in that last game. So I, I think the problem is, you know, you probably put uh, Will Johnson on Adunze, and then who's who's going to cover McMillan? Um, you know, I mean, it's going to be Wallace on the other side, but, you know, you still got to deal with uh, Polk, and, and, and they have a lot of other weapons. Right. And Michael Pendix looked really good in that semifinal game. I mean, I do think Washington uh, can move the ball. Against his Michigan defense, Michigan is, I think, clearly going to focus on uh, limiting the explosive plays um, because that was something that Texas couldn't do. I think that has to be uh, Michigan's game plan. I think they'll be reasonably successful in doing that, but but it is a scary matchup because this is one of the best offenses in college football. And I know we don't spend a lot of time talking about the ground game. It does matter a bit more in college football than in the NFL. But now with Washington being banged up there, I feel like it does allow Michigan to devote more resources to stopping the pass. So I don't know if that's like going to, to make it where they can shut down Washington's passing attack. I don't think that can happen. But I think if you're facing three legitimately very good wide receivers, If you're able to devote more resources to that and not kind of worry as much about uh, the ground game, I feel like that does at least put Michigan in a better position to have some success here defensively. Yeah, for sure. First, I need to go on a little rant about Dylan Johnson. He's the Washington running back that got hurt towards the end of the game. And I, I was just I was just beside myself that he did not roll off the football field, knowing that like he gave Texas 40 seconds or whatever it was. Yeah, uh, he got hurt. They had to stop the clock. 
And instead of, you know, punting to Texas with 15 seconds, they punted to Texas with 42 seconds, which could have cost them the game. So almost um, yeah. look, I'm sure, look, I'm sure he almost died on that play, but if that were my kid, I'd be like, dude, you got to roll. <laughs> you got to roll off the field. Or like ask right? the lineman to carry you. I think that's that. that Cause exactly. I was thinking about it in the moment. I was like, I would be calling for the lineman to like grab me. I would be like, yeah, get the lineman to carry you like yeah. off the field. Like you can't, sit on the field and be hurt in that right. situation. Um, I presume he comes back, right? I mean, I, I know he's listed as questionable. Um, I, I think part of that run game has to be that offensive line. So I doubt it's a, a zero for them. Um, I think Michigan's defense played really well uh, against Alabama. I mean, cl- they got a lot of pressure on the quarterback. I think a lot of that is that Jalen Milrow takes a lot of sacks. And that was something that Bill Connolly pointed out in his analysis before the game. And you could kind of see Milrow just, he just doesn't make quick decisions. And that certainly helped Michigan get there. Uh, Michael Penix doesn't really have that problem. But if Michigan's for, you know, front four can really get pressure uh, like they did against Alabama, that's certainly going to help. Yeah, I think it's a couple different things there where it's a very different situation where Milrow takes a lot of sacks, holds on the ball, Penix does not hold the ball super long, but still goes deep. So it's like a very different situation there. And that offensive line is, I think, better too, where they protected him very well this year. But also, they haven't faced a lot of fronts like Michigan's yet this year. So it'll be a very different test for Washington this week than what we've seen so far this year. And it's a question of how much of a difference does that make? I don't know. Honestly, I thought that I thought Texas's defense was a lot better than what they played on Monday. So maybe Washington is good enough to hold up against like better level defenses. But it is at least a question of whether or not they can hold up against likely the toughest front they've faced so far this year. Right. I I also would like to note that like Michigan doesn't really have a lot of high draft picks on this defense. The players that rate out the highest are Chris Jenkins, who's an interior lineman. And then uh, safety rod more. And this is when you tend to look at big boards. And I'm not, you know, there's there's kind of a difference between big boards and, and mock drafts or where they'll actually be picked. But, you know, safety and interior defensive linemen are not exactly premium positions. Uh, Will Johnson is an interesting one because he he is, I, I've read some stuff that he would have been a, you know, pretty high pick last year. And I think he's pretty talented. So maybe he'll end up, uh, I mean, he has an opportunity to make a lot of money. Uh, with performance in in this game but if you look at the past couple years you know they've had guys like Aiden Hutchinson that was a top pick two years ago uh they you know Mozzie Smith was an interior lineman that went in the first round uh this past year uh DJ Turner is is uh playing almost every snap for the Cincinnati Bengals uh the cornerback from Michigan this this Michigan defense doesn't have I think players that project that good at the NFL level, but they're a better unit than either of those past two units. So a lot of the credit has to go to Jesse Minter. Um, you know, do I think this defense is good? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really good and they, and yeah. they should be able to get pressure on Washington, but on the other hand, it's, it's not necessarily a unit that's full of NFL stars. Right. Either. Right. So let's talk about the opposing side here and talk about Michigan's offense taking on Washington's defense. And that Michigan offense hasn't had to do a whole lot this year, honestly, because the defense has been so good. They've been efficient, but they haven't had to like be in a lot of shootouts so far. So they could get tasked with that here, depending on how well Washington does. How well do you think Michigan will move the ball when they're facing this Washington defense? I think they'll move it really well on the ground. Uh, Washington, when I look at adjusted success rate, has the 101st best unit in the nation. That's clearly awful. And you can see it in the game against Texas. I had uh, CJ Baxter under 81 and change uh, rushing yards. And I mean, I, I was I thought that had lost by the end of the first quarter. <laughs> he was getting to the second level consistently against this Washington defense. I think Michigan's offense can do that as well. You're going to see a steady dose of Blake Corum. And if they're successful at that, like, I, I don't know how many times J.J. McCarthy is going to actually throw the ball. I think they're going to ground and pound against this team, and I think they can be successful at it. Washington's significantly better at, at defending the pass as well. Um, they, they actually have a potential first-round uh, edge rusher and in, in, in Braylon Trice is on, on that unit. So I think it's pretty simple for Michigan. You, you try to cram it down their throats, and uh, if you're successful – I mean, basically, you try to cram it down the throats and hope you don't make the same types of little ticky tacky mistakes that you did against Alabama. And I think that's a formula for being up in the second half, which leads to more running the ball. 
So I do think Michigan is going to be able to move it. Um, you know, if they're fortunate, they'll get some explosive plays out of Blake Quorum, who's who's certainly capable of it. Um, and 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 honestly, that's really where where the edge is for Michigan. And it's not just the ticky tack stuff running the ball, but also just not muffing sixteen punts. I think that yeah. would also probably and not and not like catching punts at the five yard line. Attempting to catch punts at the five yard line, dropping yeah. it, picking hey, it up, nearly getting a safety and losing the game. He, uh, he got the ball and he got hit really hard. So yep. good for him for hanging on to that thing. Yeah, he definitely. That, did. that was, uh, you know, all Michigan fans have uh, nightmares of uh, the Michigan State game. Um, yep. Maybe almost a decade ago where yep. a punt gets blocked and they return it for a touchdown. I mean, that was almost that was almost Sparty part two uh, at the end of that game against Alabama. Can we get some stick them to the Michigan special teams in general, like both sides, like punters and punt returners alike? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure someone's hopefully oh, someone's thinking about that. They got to the Michigan staff. Now you mentioned that your model has this at uh, Michigan by 3.3. It's currently a four and a half. So you said you have no interest in the side right now. How much movement would you need to have interest in buying back on the Washington side in this game? Like we do see a lot yeah. of late movement. It's only Wednesday right now. So this thing could move before we get to Monday. Are you considering it at five, five and a half? Or how much do we need to see this thing move before you consider taking a bite at the Washington spread? Yeah, I don't think I'm taking a bite at the Washington spread. I mean, if anything, like gun to head, I would actually probably lean towards Michigan okay. um, at this number. I think the matchups do favor them. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, there's certainly ways that Washington can win. I, I, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to dismiss that. But um, but yeah, I think the market is about right. And, and uh, if anything, uh, I think we'll move towards Michigan. Well, you said this game does come down to matchups. So let's dig in and talk about the matchups here and talk about some player props over at FanDuel Sportsbook. When you take a look at the prop market with where things stand right now, Ed, where are you seeing value in this game? I had two props in that in that Texas Washington game, and I already talked about CJ Baxter and how I basically thought that was going to lose in the first quarter. Uh, It actually won. And the other prop I had in that game was Jalen McMillan over, uh, what, I don't know, 81, no, 70 some yards. 76 and a half is where it was, I believe. Yeah, 76 and a half. It actually moved against me at DraftKings, and I ended up betting it at 72. Uh, I'm very insulted that it would move against me. But uh, <laughs> McMillan didn't have a great first half, uh, really came back, had the touchdown, um, came pretty close to going over. So that was, well, I mean, there was plenty of excitement towards the end of that game for a variety of reasons. But McMillan over almost went over that total. I like him to go over again. Um, the All these numbers are down compared to where they were in the last game, and I think that's appropriate because Michigan's pass defense is really good. Um, but I do feel like McMillan is the right play over here because they're going to put their best corner on, on Roma Dunze, and that's probably what they should do. Um, but McMillan's total should probably be in the 80s. You know, If he were healthy and had this season that he's capable of, um, I think it would be in the 80s if not in the low nineties. So uh, I do like over for Jalen McMillan, basically for the same reasons um, that I, I I talked about last week. I think he's a super talented receiver. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in the first round of the the NFL draft. Um, So uh, yeah, it's a player prop. I like, could you apply the same logic to Jalen Polk? Cause I know that he kind of gets the similar thing where he is out there quite a bit he also would benefit if they decide to devote a lot of resources to shopping at Dunze. Polk's number is 53 and a half. Would you consider that with Polk, or is it more so you like the talent of McMillan enough where you want to ride with him instead? I want to ride with McMillan's talent. I was really hoping Polk's number would be in the 80s because of what he did in that game. He yeah. obviously had that huge first play on the drive. It's not. Uh, it's it's probably near where it is supposed to be. I did not actually go through kind of game by game his total, so maybe yeah. maybe there is some value. Um, but last year, you know, we had the situation where uh, uh, Quentin Johnson for TCU went nuts against Michigan, yeah. and uh, I believe his total against Georgia was it was either over a hundred or in the nineties. Yeah. I was really hoping for a similar situation with Polk, but we're just not going to get it. So. Um, yeah, I'm staying away from that. I think he had like two catches in that uh, Georgia game. It was I think he had two targets. Two targets, yeah. Two targets and three yards. Yeah, that was, that was uh it was, that was a fun one for sure. Uh, no sweat under, which is always a delight. Now with McMillan as well, alternate markets here. 
FanDuel knows that Washington likes to chuck it deep. So you're not getting like a great number if you look at alt markets. But I think the way that Washington plays offensively, it is conducive to overs or uh, alt markets because sure. it's a lot of deep pass attempts. And, and Penix has shown that he's very accurate in those deep throws, willing to go that way. McMillan can get downfield targets too. I would say looking at FanDuel's numbers, I don't think there's actually a lot of value in looking at alt markets right now with where they're at. Uh, but I think he's the kind of player where I'd at least check to see where mm-hmm. things are at. But I agree with that I think 64 and a half, pretty good number for McMillan in the receiving yardage number. Do you want to check Blake Corum here? You talked about how they should be able to run the ball. One one and a half probably yeah. seems high enough to scare you off, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes over. Uh, yeah. I do think he's got the ability to break some explosive plays. But, you know, Blake Quorum's been, uh, you know, been lined in the 80s all year. Yeah. And has mostly gone under. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I have some confidence, but I, I, I'm, i yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to that. Yeah, I think that's a high enough number where. Uh, it's kind of like the what you thought might happen with Poke, where like people see him go nuts in the game before, and like, oh, okay, cool, we yeah. can go this way. But uh, that's kind of what happened with Blake Corman, as opposed to Jalen Polk. Any so, final thoughts for you on this game, Ed? Yeah, actually, I just, I just noticed, uh, you know, JJ was at eighteen and a half uh, earlier. It looks like it's gone up on FanDuel, and this is actually one that I don't like. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely liked him over in the semifinal game. I think there's some game scripts where where they're just able to run the ball and they don't need JJ to kind of make plays. So I, I did not like, I thought about, you know, JJ over 18 and a half yards, just, just like last week. Right. Uh, I, I don't think it makes as much sense just given the game script, uh, given not the game script, but the matchups, yeah. uh, the matchups against this Washington defense. I think um, in Michigan's ideal world, it gets pretty simple and they, they run up the gut a lot. Well, to your point, McCarthy was at, I think, nine rushing yards for most of that game against yeah. Alabama and then had a 16 yard rush on that that crucial drive. So he got over the 15 and a half, which is where it was when we talked. Uh, but right. it was because they were in push mode. And right. if you don't think they're going to be exactly. in push mode for this game, it, it makes a lot of sense to stay away, especially if that number has gone up seven yards from where it was last week. I mean, they might be in push mode. I mean, it's certainly Maybe. not yeah. out of the question, right? Because Washington yeah. is, is a very good football team, uh, especially that offense but exactly you know like um you know jj goes over on on the run and that's exactly how kind of i expected it to work but there's no celebration because sack yards count against quarterbacks in college right (laughs) you're sweating at the whole rest of the game (laughs) yeah so my son was next to me he's like hey didn't your jj bet win i was like yeah i mean we're looking good but he can't get sacked and i actually don't think jj took a single sack in that game so that no he didn't I that kept refreshing up. the app because I was like, I was like concerned that I had missed one or something like that, but he didn't know. So, you know, you do worry about like, oh, trying to make a play late and he goes back and he trips. And um, so, uh, but yeah, so just, I actually think that's uh, uh, kind of a good lesson if you're betting props out there. It's good to check the house rules right. on a lot of these props because it's not as simple as a spread. I mean, there's kind of no ambiguity about what what's happened, what happens when you're betting on the final score of the game, but there can potentially be ambiguity um, in uh, player props. And I actually haven't checked this, but I would presume in the NFL, like sack yards don't count against a quarterback's rushing total. Nope. And that's because that's what they do in the official stat numbers in the right. NFL. It is different from college. They count sacks against the rushing total. So it, 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 just keep that in mind. Yeah. Jared Goff finished his college career with negative rushing yards. I think Shadour Sanders had like negative 300 rushing yards this year, like because of the way that sacks were counted. Uh, I, you look at his game log, he was like negative 30, negative 30, because he just never ran outside of when he was getting sacked 14 times a game. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind for sure. When betting these props and in general, knowing the house rules of your respective books is always a wise move. That is all that we have here for today for this college football national championship, but it should be a very fun game when that does come around on monday before then though we got a lot of nfl action so again make sure you swing back here tomorrow ed is gonna be with us again break down nfl week number 18 with the key games on tap we'll get his thoughts on texans versus colts bills versus dolphins and much more right here in the feed and of course tom vecchio breaking down those two games as well primetime tom talking props for those games as well ed what is going on for you this week over at the power rank I talked to Tage Seth of Sumer Sports on the Football Analytics Show podcast. He actually had a bet on this national championship game. So uh, that should be up by Wednesday night. And, um, yeah, check out my sports betting uh, email newsletter. Uh, 
Five Nugget Saturday. If you're looking for any action on a weekend, is is the service for you. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. And of course, that service does run beyond college football season two. That's a year round thing. So uh, yep. even though college football is wrapping up, that will still be in action. Go to thepowerrank.com to find that. Find Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. You can find uh, me on Twitter at Jim Sonis. I am on threads at jim.sonis. You can find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy the game on Monday night. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down NFL week number 18. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast. Podcast Network.